One of my favorite pieces of mathematics is Taylor series, which is this crazy formula that lets you take a function like e to the x and to write it as an infinite series. But this doesn't always work. And there's actually a lot of pretty common misconceptions that I see students and sometimes even teachers making. So in this video, we're gonna see some kind of funky examples that will hopefully clear up this issue of when does a Taylor series actually converge to the specific function. Super quick review of Taylor series first, or you can click to the next timestamp if you're a master already. The big idea of Taylor series is about doing polynomial approximations. For example, here's the function e to the x, and this is what the graph of it looks like. And then the standard sort of first semester calculus approximation we know how to do is a linear approximation. So at the value of x equal to zero, we get a straight line that matches the value at zero and the slope at zero. And well, it's not a bad approximation to the original e to the x nearby zero, but quickly it becomes pretty bad then the idea of a Taylor polynomial is, well, what if we had higher order terms, quadratic terms, cubic terms, and so forth? For example, if I drag my slider from n equal to one to n equal to two, what is computed out is this polynomial. It is now a quadratic. If I really zoom out here, you can start to see that the quadratic and the exponential really are very different far away from the point x equal to zero but close to x equal to zero, it's a good approximation. And then if I just take the slider and add sort of three, four, five, and more terms, I just get a better and better approximation. So that's the big idea of a Taylor approximation. The software that I'm using, by the way, for all of these computations and graphing is Maple Learn, which is the sponsor of today's video. So if you're interested, the link to check them out is down in the description. So then if this is the Taylor polynomial where I am approximating my function, where it's a sum up to some particular value n, then the question is, when can I turn this approximation into an equality by taking the finite sum and making it an infinite series? And then just to be clear about our terminology, the a is referred to as the center of the series. It's the place where I'm taking all the derivatives when I'm trying to match the series to the function. Before we get to the really funky example, I want to just do logarithm, which is a pretty standard example, but leads to an important confusion. If I plot logarithm of x, this is the graph of it. And the problem is that logarithm is not defined at zero. If I try to compute it as a Taylor formula, then Maple Learn is gonna tell me that it's just undefined. So what can I do instead? Well, I have another slider here, which is the a slider. And this is part of the expression, the x minus a to the power of k, and all the derivatives get evaluated at a. So this is basically saying, where am I doing my approximation? So for example, instead of a equal to zero, I could plug in a equal to one, and now I can approximate logarithm around the value of one. That's entirely fine to do with a linear approximation, or as I increase the value of my n here, I can get a better and better approximation near the value of one. Yes, these expressions can start looking pretty complicated here, but that's okay because the computer can do all the heavy lifting and computing those out for you. It's able to do finite sums like this quickly. Now, what I want to note is that even though I've gone to 14 terms here, that this is a very good visually, at least looking approximation, sort of around one. But as soon as I get to the value of two, it just drops off and the approximation becomes terrible. And it's relevant here that one is one unit away from zero, but one is also one unit away from two. And the point is that it doesn't actually matter how many terms I have here, all of them are gonna be bad after the value of two. So what's going on here? Let's actually figure out what the Taylor series for logarithm is opposed to just letting the computer do it for us. I can take the first derivative of logarithm, it's one over x, and then all the other derivatives follow just a reasonable pattern. Since I'm going to be doing this approximation centered at the value of one, I'm gonna plug one into my formula everywhere. And it creates this kind of nice pattern. I notice, first of all, positive, negative, positive, negative going all the way down. Then I also notice I can write these in terms of factorial. It's for the first derivative, zero factorial. For the second derivative, one factorial, third derivative, two factorial, and so forth. So basically it's like a factorial, but with one index beneath the number of derivatives. So putting all of this together, I can say that my Taylor series centered at the value of one for logarithm is this, where I've replaced the derivatives with negative one to the K and then K minus one factorial. 
on the top there's a k minus 1 factorial, on the bottom there's a k factorial, almost all of those factorial factors are going to cancel except for the largest one, the kth one, and so I can simplify this to be nothing but minus 1 to the k divided by k times x minus 1 to the k. Now, as you recall when we were doing this visually, beyond the value of x equal to 2, this was terrible. So why is that? Well, let me remind you a little bit of the theory here. If I refer to the terms in this series as being a sub k, then I can take the ratio of these terms, a k plus 1 divided by a k. It, it's a big mess, but don't worry, it mostly cleans up, like, we don't have to worry about any of the minus 1s because they're inside of an absolute value. There's a lot of x minus 1s on the top and the bottom. Almost all of them are going to cancel except just one factor on the top. And so this ratio actually just simplifies to being just k over k plus 1 times the absolute value of x minus 1. And then the idea of the ratio test, where I'm looking at the ratio of those terms, is I want those ratios to get smaller if I'm going to have this thing converging. So I'm going to demand that this is less than 1. The, in a limit as k goes to infinity, k divided by k plus 1 is just 1. So this is just the demand that my value of x is within 1 of the center of 1. And so I get an interval of convergence of 0 up to 2. I've also done a couple things quickly in my head. If I actually plug in 2, I get the alternating harmonic series, which converges. That's why I said less than or equal to 2. If I plug in the value of 0, it's the harmonic series, which diverges, and so I don't have equality on the other side. Either way, for this particular function logarithm and centered at 1, I get this particular series converging on an interval of convergence 0 up to 2. So graphically, this is totally aligned with what we saw earlier and just gives a little bit of a cautionary tale. You can't just compute derivatives. You also have to figure out, well, does that series that I get, does it actually converge? And the ratio test is a way to do this. Now, this is the real reason why I recorded this video, because this is where a lot of people will just stop. That is, we have this series, it converges in this region, certainly it diverges outside of it. But does it converge to the original function? Does it converge to logarithm? Let me give actually a different function to illustrate the point a little bit more clearly. I'm going to consider the function e to the minus 1 over x squared. Looks like a perfectly reasonable function. To help me graph this function, I'm going to turn to Maple Calculator for your phone. The link is down in the description. And again, thank you to Maple for sponsoring today's video. So I'm going to plot the exponential, and it's going to be minus 1 divided by x squared. And here we get this delightful plot. I could do many things here. I could differentiate or integrate it. But what I really want to go in is look at this plot. If I zoom in near x equal to 0, it looks pretty much entirely horizontal. And that's because this function is very special. It's a function where every derivative at 0 is 0. It cannot tell at 0 that this thing is not just a horizontal line. Now, e to the minus 1 over x squared actually isn't defined exactly at 0. I mean, this is just undefined. And so I'm actually going to give a slight tweak on my function. It's e to the minus 1 over x squared everywhere else. But I'm just going to input it in in a piecewise way that at x equal to 0, it's just equal to 0. This is now, I claim, an infinitely differentiable function. If I use the definition of the derivative, like limit as h goes to 0, of the function at 0 plus h minus f of 0 divided out by h, this limit's going to be 0 because of the way that exponentials are going to dominate all polynomials. And so this derivative evaluated at 0 is also equal to 0. And then you can do a similar argument to suggest the second derivative, the third derivative, the fourth derivative, Every derivative is going to be 0 for this funky function. So here's the point. All the derivatives for this function exist. So I can compute its Taylor series. Its Taylor series is nothing but 0 times x to the k for every value of k. This we call the 0 series. It is a power series. It converges everywhere. There's an infinite radius of convergence for this function. But the series is never anything but 0. The series is just completely flat. But e to the minus 1 over x squared isn't completely flat. So what do we have happening? We have the series converging everywhere to 0. It looks like the Taylor series should work. Its radius of convergence is all values of r. Yet the series has nothing to do with the actual function, has nothing to do with the f. And so you cannot just look at the interval of convergence of your series and conclude that it must converge to the function. It converges for sure, this trivial series converges, but it doesn't converge to the original function. 
So the big issue is that there are two different concepts being confused. The first is a term called analytic. An analytic function is very nice because to be analytic in some little open interval, it means that the Taylor series of that function actually converges to the function. The previous example was not analytic. So an analytic function is very nice. This is in contrast with the weaker notion of a smooth function which is infinitely differentiable. Every analytic function is infinitely differentiable, but as we just saw, the converse is not true. The interval of convergence is still useful. It's a reasonable thing for calculus teachers to ask you to do because if you're outside of the interval of convergence, then surely it does not converge to this function value at all. You know something by knowing that you're outside of the interval of convergence. But just because it is inside the interval of convergence, that is not enough. So what can you do? How can we resolve this problem? Well, for this, we have to study the remainder. And the remainder is just defined to be the difference between the function and the Taylor polynomial of nth degree. So I'll just define Rn is that difference. And the real thing that makes all of this Taylor series business work is that we have theorems that control how bad that remainder can be. That's not the subject of this video. I've actually previously talked about these remainders and used them to prove that, for example, the exponential series actually converges to the exponential itself. That has been done in a previous video. But all I want to illustrate is that there is one further step that we're doing, studying this remainder that we have to do, and we cannot just look at the interval of convergence. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. Do check out Maple Learn and Maple Calculator, the sponsor for today's video down in the description. If you have any questions, put those down in the comments and we'll do some more math in the next video.